sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, back to the afternoon um, session. So we have the second of a series of sessions on environmental justice, movements, and resistance. Um, we have four speakers. Three will be physically in the room, and a fourth will be joining us remotely. Um, so we'll take all four presentations first, and then we'll have enough time, I hope, for a really good discussion of all of our presentations. So the first presentation is by Diana Jimenez, and it is on soybeans, violence, and justice, um, the environmental resistance of Mayan women, women and men in Hopechen, Mexico. Sounds exciting. Okay. Let me see. There we go. Thank you. Um, so I've never. Okay, so hopefully I don't confuse the clicker with the microphone. Um, but hi, thank you so much for, for being with us here today. My name is Diana. I am a PhD student here at UEA. Um, the work I will be presenting, though, was part of my master's thesis, or was, was my master's thesis. And I will be focusing, sorry, so it was about an environmental movement against genetically modified soybean in southern Mexico. And for this presentation, I will be speaking mostly about the theoretical contributions of the thesis. And so I'm sorry if I skip a lot of the sort of empirical richness of the case study, but I want to highlight sort of what I was trying to get to. Um, and so I will briefly speak about the case study um, and then about the research, and then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about these, these contributions. And so, um, in the 1940s, Mexico began to incorporate a model of industrial agriculture into its development agenda. And since the 1990s, it incorporated Monsanto's genetically modified soybean as part of their strategy to reduce the increasing imports of, of, of soybean to the country, which were skyrocketing because of its increased use in national agri-food industries. And the reason why genetically modified soybeans were a good way to foster national production of this crop was because GM soybeans <laughs> promised to reduce the costs of production. And they did so because GM soybeans are made to resist Roundup, or glyphosate, which is a pesticide that eradicates weeds. And so it allowed to replace manual weeding, and so the costs sort of associated with this manual labor with increased pesticide application. Um, but in Copelchen Campeche, Mayan men and women have been organizing against it since, since 2010. And this was one of the states, one of the 10 states where, where, where GM soybean was introduced. They argue that GM soybean here is leading to increased levels of pesticide in, in the region, but more generally, that is promoting the expansion of industrial agriculture. And this in turn um, means that it's promoting deforestation, it's decreasing flora and fauna, and it's contaminating water sources. And for this, and, and for them, this means that it is damaging their local economies, it's jeopardizing their health, and it's threatening the reproduction of their communities. And so in the summer of 2017, I conducted semi-structured interviews with Mayan men and women organizing against Monsanto, and I became interested in understanding, through a feminist political ecology approach, what were the grievances that they were speaking about, um, and how these grievances came to articulate their resistance in, in response. And I basically found um, three things. The first one was that um, they, they, in, their narratives spoke of um, GM soybean as being a process of violence, and this meant that they were actually telling a story about structural violence. And in doing so, they were allowing us to have a much richer conceptualization of what this might mean. A, uh, a, a understanding that was actually sort of lacking in political ecology literature that day they, they tend to refer as environmental degradation as violence, but actually do not go in depth about why and how. Um, and so briefly, the concept of structural violence was coined by, by Johann Galtung, and he was basically trying to go beyond a narrow definition of violence, what he called direct violence, 
basically of situations where one person inflicts harm on another person through a given action. He argues sort of more broadly that processes that result in, in unequal life chances where we can avoid it can actually be called violence. And he called this process structural violence. He saw structural violence then as sort of coming through economic and political dynamics. Um, economic referring to the uneven distribution of resources and political referring to power asymmetries in decision making power. Um, and he saw this process as legitimized by what he termed cultural violence, which basically um, refers to the discourses that legitimize and normalize unequal power um, relations and their consequences. And so what the, nar the, the narratives of Mayan men and women allows us to understand is that structural violence actually encompasses many other dynamics besides the economic and the political one. Um, yes, these ones are important and they do result in, un in, in unequal life chances, but they aren't the only ones that do so. They call attention to an environmental dimension, a social and a physical one. They spoke of the, of, of the environment um, as they highlighted how this can be a site and a subject of, 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 of harm in and of itself. And how actually it's very tied to individual and to collective well-being as particular livelihoods sustain and are sustained by environmental relations. They spoke of a social dimension when they spoke of how um, by threatening their ways of being, GM Soybean was actually um, sort of hindering the reproduction of their, the reproduction in the future of the, sorry, in, in the present of their livelihoods and culture, but, the, but also the future of um, Mayan generations and the survival of Mayan communities altogether in, in this place. And lastly, they spoke of a physical dimension when they called attention to how this was harming their health and their body. Um, and how this is an important site for um, sort of realizing one's own potential as it impacts what we can call our body capital. Um, and so secondly, uh, they show that in fact, this process is legitimized by cultural violence, but that we can understand this better actually as ontological and epistemic violence. So ontological violence means the imposition of particular worldviews and value systems. And epistemic violence refers to the imposition of a particular form of knowledge and the denial of other forms. And this here is present as the harm done against Mayan communities is sort of being normalized and legitimized through a development imaginary that frames agriculture as an activity for economic growth rather than for local sustenance and as an activity that is more important than other rural activities. Um, and I forgot to say earlier that one of the ways this is hurting their local economies is that it's hurting subsistence agriculture and beekeeping, which are one of the two main sort of dimensions of their, of their economies. Um, and this is, uh, and, uh, and epistemic violence is present here as this development imaginary sort of sustained by claims and ties to expert knowledge and expertise that when they get entangled with racist discourses against indigeneity, which have been present in Mexico since colonial times, they actually result in the denial of indigenous knowledge and of indigenous people as knowledge holders and producers. And, and then in, in, in illuminating these other dimensions and um, by reframing what we mean by cultural violence, they actually also show that structural violence is characterized by these other dynamics. And I won't go into much detail now, um, but I'm happy to come back to them um, in, in the questions, but they called attention to how this is a present that is a process that is multi-temporal, that is visible through the body and the environment, that is gendered, that is influenced by spatial dynamics, and that is reproduced through institutions. Um, and so then, to recap, basically, they called attention to how structural violence has much more um, interrelated dimensions than Galton or that Galton sort of originally envisioned, um, that it is characterized by many other processes, and that we can better understand cultural violence as um, composed of, ontol of ontologies and epistemologies. And so now, to move on to the second contribution, I also found that 
they spoke, when they were sort of telling what they were demanding um, through their mobilization, they were speaking about environmental justice, but they were also expanding our, our, our concept of it. Um, and so I'm more than sure that you are all um, acquainted with uh, Schlossberg's theorization of environmental justice and how it encompasses interrelated types of justices, uh, procedure, distribution, and recognition, which ultimately converge on a fourth, which is justice as capabilities. And these demands were present in the movement. Um, justice as distribution was there as they demanded that the state distributes its resources more fairly, that it gives more to subsistence agriculture and beekeeping vis-a-vis -vis soybean cultivation. They demanded justice as procedure as they asked for the institutionalization of a dialogue between Mayan communities and the state. Um, they demanded justice as recognition um, as they wanted the end to the, to the, discrimina the discrimination that they have faced as, as indigenous people in Mexico as they acknowledge to be uh, for their worldviews and their values to be recognized and to be considered knowledge holders. And finally, they were demanding justice as capabilities as they were asking for their right for their present and future well-being. However, their demands go further than this in two ways. The first one um, is that they were also asking for something that I termed justice as delivery. And this is because their demand that the government sort of do its job and fulfill its contractual obligation isn't actually encompassed by any of the other four forms of justice. And to give an example by what I mean with this, um, they were demanding that the government made sure that a ruling passed by the Supreme Court of Justice temporarily banning um, the, the distribution of GM soybeans in the country until an indigenous consultation was carried out was actually upheld and that people who were violating this ruling were actually sanctioned. And the second way in which they go further than this um, is something that I termed gender justice. And this is because, um, and this will come clear in a second, um, Mayan women were actually sort of engaging in another set of demands against, uh, or to Mayan men, sort of in addition to those against the state. And so in sort of bringing light to this uh, form of justice, we can see that environmental justice isn't only sort of plural, but actually it's multi-leveled. Uh, and here, unlike Mayan men, Mayan women were describing their participation in the movement as a struggle in and of itself. They, they told how they faced discrimination from government authorities for being indigenous people and for being women, but also within the movement for being women. They had sort of gone through various confrontations with their husbands uh, for participating and faced numerous criticisms within their, 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 their communities. Um, and so as part of this double struggle, um, Mayan women have been actually framing their participation in the movement through the use of gender discourses. They're actually sort of claiming how important, they, uh, how, how important it is that they participate because they possess values that men do not. They're claiming they are more sensitive, more caring, um, less susceptible to, corru to, to corruption, uh, more responsible. And what I think is really interesting is that I think that in holding these arguments, what they're doing is holding Mayan men partially responsible for letting GM soybean arrive to their region uh, and for the consequences and damages that, that, that it has brought about. And they're using the situation as a way to decertify male authority and to claim it for themselves, um, and to particularly to do things differently and, do, and, and to do things their way. Um, and so then what we can see through this is um, what I was saying. This is not working. Um, sorry. OK, there. Um, that then we have sort of two levels of justice demands. On one hand, Mayan men and women are demanding from the state the five forms of justice that, that we went through. And on another level, Mayan women are demanding from Mayan men and more generally their communities and their families to be included in decision-making processes and for their authority to be recognized. And so my last um, contribution was that when we sort of create these two extended concepts, 
we actually can see how they speak to one another um, quite directly and quite nicely in a way that we can understand both concepts as um, sort of a different side of the same theoretical coin. And this is to say that then we can understand the, 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 the struggle for environmental justice as a struggle against um, structural violence. And I won't go into much detail into the diagram, but basically what it is trying to show is that every demand of justice is counteracting um, one or more dimensions of structural violence. So that then when we look at all of the demands together, um, environmental justice actually seeks to address all of the um, sort of characteristics of or all of the dimensions and characteristics of structural violence. And to give an example, justice as recognition would be challenging um, sort of the rootedness of structural violence in ontological and epistemic assumptions, right? Because it is demanding that the assumptions and prejudices that have been in place and have, and, and have allowed for the denial of indigenous communities be um, erased and or, or, or be overcome. Um, so, then I guess the main three um, sort of takeaway points of my presentation was that hopefully by analyzing this movement and sort of the grievances that they spoke about and the resistance that they are putting in, in, in response, we can have a much better understanding of why we think of environmental degradation as being violent. Um, and then we can have a much, so and, and we can understand this because it's structural violence. And then we can understand structural violence in a much more complete way than before. We can see how it has uh, many more dimensions, how it has particular characteristics, and how it is rooted um, and legitimized. We can also understand how environmental justice um, actually has one more type of justice and how it may also be um, gendered and thus a multi-level concept. And finally, in sort of the theme of the conference, um, bringing these two um, concepts together hopefully allows for a transformative connection that or through which we can understand the struggle for environmental justice as a struggle against environmental, sorry, against structural violence. The struggle Oh, the struggle for environmental justice as the struggle against uh, structural violence. <laughs> Thank you. Mary Menton from the University of Sussex, and I'm here with Felipe Milanese of the Federal University of Bahia. Um, yes, that's us. <laughs> And um, we will be co-presenting on a project that we're working on, um, on sustainable development and atmospheres of violence, focusing on, in this case, talking about environmental injustices and experiences of environmental defenders. And just a, a quick shout out to all of our other, other co-authors who couldn't be here today. Um, and that we are funded, this project is funded under the British Academy um, Sustainable Development Program. Is this going to work? Yes, yeah, no. Do you oh, mind yeah, so give me two work. seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> um, again, so I, I am going to talk for, for the first part just to present the main ideas of what we've been doing with this project, um, the theory behind it, where we're going, and, um, and then I will hand on, and also a little bit of our results from Guinea-Bissau, and then I will hand over to Felipe, who will talk about some of our preliminary results from Brazil. There we go. Okay, so just to quick, quickly put this into con context, um, I'm not sure if you are all aware, Global Witness has been doing a database of murders of environmental um, defenders for the last, since 2012. Um, and we can see, oh, sorry. Brazil is, in 2017, was top on the list, um, but we have violence uh, in many different countries and in different types of countries, different regimes, different histories uh, of colonialism, etc. And to point out that it's not violence against the board, against environmental defenders, but actually you're seeing 
cases of increased violence or higher levels of violence against particular groups like indigenous peoples in Brazil, who represent 16% of the murders of environmental defenders, but only 0.4% uh, of the population. Um, quickly, where we're working, Ecuador, Brazil, Guinea-Bissau, DRC, um, Bangladesh, and Cambodia. And the idea was to pick countries that have very different levels of murders per million inhabitants, but also very different histories in terms of whether they're authoritarian, whether or not they have more true democracies, etc. We wanted to, or want to still, we're only a third of the way into the project, understand how environmental defenders experience violence, um, how these emerge, what are the drivers of, these, of this violence against defenders, and also what kinds of safeguards can be put in place, and are they actually effective in protecting defenders? But, we're, we have started off really taking a step back and looking at this definition of environmental defenders. The Global Witness data says that environmental defenders are people who take peaceful action either voluntarily or professionally to protect the environment or land rights. They may not define themselves as defenders. Um, there are many caveats within that, many problems within that definition that we're starting to dig into as we move forward with the research particularly this tendency to label individuals as defenders and to ignore the collective defense strategies, to ignore collective experiences of violence and rights violations. Um, also, the Global Witness database includes deaths of park guards um, linked to poaching, which is, again, a very problematic area. We have green militarization. These park guards are given guns. This is not a straightforward case of peaceful actors being murdered. And also, do these people identify themselves as defenders? You know, the fact that they say they may not define themselves that way is, is quite problematic. Um, that said, <laughs> what do we know based on the information that is available? Um, uh, Middledorp and Le Billon did a study based on these, the database from Global, oops, sorry, <laughs> the database from Global Witness, and you see a tendency towards murder in the middle. Um, if you look at the democracy index, um, so these are going to be the areas that are more authoritarian, uh, sorry, this is more authoritarian, this is more um, democratic, and you have a tendency towards a peak in murders of environmental defenders in the areas in the middle that are not strong democracies, neither are they strongly authoritarian. And um, another study that I was a part of that's coming out soon, we compared um, murders to per capita, again, to rural, rural of law. Are these countries places where you can expect to find justice, where you can expect the laws to be implemented? And not that surprisingly, you have higher murder rates in the countries where rural, rural, rule of law is not being respected. And this links back to questions of impunity. The number of cases of murders that have not been solved are quite high in many of these countries. But for us, we're looking at the fact that these murders are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, for every person that's murdered, how many people are being threatened? For every person that is killed, how many people have been thrown in jail, criminalized, intimidated, suffered uh, smear campaigns? It's the, the level, we don't know, um, but we know that it is quite a lot from the experience of our preliminary research. So, but also stepping back a bit, what are we looking at when we talk about atmospheres of violence? Um, because, again, and it's really helpful that I got to go after Diana. Um, <laughs> but what we're, what we're talking about is more than just direct physical violence. Can we think about, again, going back to green violence, militarization of national parks, throwing people out of, of their lands, um, necropolitics, who, choosing who dies and who lives. Um, and also slow violence, when we think about environmental degradation and the violence that can occur, which is often very slow and almost invisible, that we don't notice it happening, but the impacts on a, a person's body or community um, accumulates over time. And again, we're really looking quite a lot 
not just at physical, but also psychological violence and, um, and threats, intimidation, criminalization, smear campaigns, etc. And just bringing this back to this question, how does this fit? I think it's pretty obvious how this fits into an environmental justice conference, but we're also, I think, extremely relevant to the questions of indispensability and intersectionality because we're trying to understand how things are coming at people from very many different angles, the complexity of this, and thinking about the murders of people who are often marginalized um, and are indispensable. So one of the things that's coming out of these uh, initial stages is thinking about collective experiences of violence. When somebody in the community is murdered, it has an effect. When somebody is threatened, it has an effect beyond just that individual. Um, and these are some quotes from people that we've been speaking to. You know, none of us can go anywhere alone. We can't go into town, we can't go out. Um, they can threaten me and I'm not gonna stop, but what ha frightens me the most is what's happening to my family. And these sorts of threats, not just against the individual, but against their families, um, getting their families essentially to act as a force to stop them because their families are so afraid of what will happen if they are killed. So taking us very quickly um, to Guinea-Bissau where um, I carry out a couple of weeks of research, um, Guinea-Bissau on the scale in terms of murders was very low. There were no murders reported. However, it's important to take into consideration questions of media. Um, is there free press? Is there access to information? Are those things bubbling up to the surface where organizations like Global Witness would actually know if somebody was killed in Guinea-Bissau? Maybe not. So these, thank you, these lists are incomplete and we know that. Um, it's also a country extreme history of insta instability. There have been coups, there have been repetitive uh, changes in government in the last years. Um, democracy index for 2018 was 1.98 out of 10. So this is a country, again, if you look at the murder in the middle, it's on the, on the scale um, towards authoritarian. What we're looking at, uh, case studies, sustainable fishing agreement by the EU, and how actually it's not so sustainable. Um, hydroelectric dams that are being put in place, uh, excluding people from their territories, and the question of talking to people, what are we gonna eat? You know, you can't eat electricity. You need something. We need to think about our needs. Um, and also laundering of stockpile timber has been going on with the stamp of approval of the Fed East Convention. But I don't wanna go into too much more on that because I wanna leave enough time for Felipe to tell us a bit about the current situation in Brazil. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, well, I'll just mention very briefly about Brazil inside the context of this project. I'm speaking tomorrow more about the context of violence after uh, Bolsonaro and the rise of fascism. Uh, it's, it's uh, Brazil apparently that was still in a democracy. I think that many things are changing very fast there. But political instability, uh, as, as Philippe Lebillon has shown, help us to explain the rise of violence from the last years, 2015, 2016, and 17, related to, to murders. But as Mary was saying, murder is just one part of the story, you know? and. Uh, and we're trying to understand other forms of violence associated with the environmental conflicts, that murder is maybe killing the leaders, but also dispossession the entire community, or threats, or other forms of political action against uh, collectives. Uh, well, the history of Brazil presents high rates of violence and racism. Racism uh, is structuring the inequalities in the country. It means environmental violence there is, is structured by racism. Uh, we, we built that idea also from a meeting that we had, we hosted in the beginning of the year to discuss environmental violence with environmental activists and the issue of racism wa was brought both by black and maroon Colombo communities and indigenous people as a structure to, the, to their conflicts. Uh, <clears throat> 
it's a very unequal society, so we're also trying to bring the class issue uh, to, to the debate on environmental violence and environmental uh, murders. This is not well clear in Global Witness uh, reports, and it has produced a lot of debate inside Brazil when the environment, when Brazil appeared internationally as the most violent country against environmentalists. And, and suddenly we didn't realize that saying the country that there was that many environmentalists being killed. It means they are away from the city centers, Sao Paulo, Rio, but deep in the Amazon or the Northeast. Uh, land concentration and land grab is a, plays a key role in the structure of violence in, in Brazil as well. So we try to analyze the relationship between mining and agribusiness, soil plantations, and, uh, and cattle ranching. In <clears throat> many cases, communities are fighting against those enemies as well, you know, against Valley Mining Company and against uh, a, a huge landowner. Uh, and the ideology of development of order and progress that is in the Brazilian flag used to have, should have love as well, you know, it's the positivist name, is love, order and progress, but they took out love since the beginning of the construction of the country. Bolsonaro is not the... <laughs> anything new in this sense. But uh, this ideology of development and growth, how does it works in producing the conflicts uh, uh, with communities that, that are not fighting for development of, of, of progress, but they are fighting against this order, this violent order of genocide in Brazil. It means there is a, 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 an interesting bridge with degrowth movements here in Europe and, and other forms of existence uh, that indigenous people, uh, peasants, communities are, are proposing as an alternative to the development of the nation. I think this has something related to the ontological and also epistemological violence that Diana mentions. And well, uh, but not be uh, 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 the intention of our project is not being too depressing. And <laughs> we also looked at the resistance, actually. So it's such a diverse country with cultural diversity. These people are fighting since Brazil was starting to be invaded 500 years ago. So we tried to, uh, to, to, to focus on the alternatives that are being played by those uh, fighters, defenders. Uh, there is, uh, so water people, forest people, how they, they, they manage to defend their environment which are not separated from the, the idea of the collective. Usually they don't like the word defenders, as Mary was saying, because it's, it's more related to the, the existence, uh, the, the, the possibility to exist, and exist means exist with the environment that does not separate. So we challenge this colonial dichotomy uh, in, 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 the, in the interviews and, and the portraits that we're building. Um, it's, uh, and the term defenders that has been really uh, criticized by the defenders themselves. Uh, just one uh, example is that there is a, 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 a politics in Brazil today between calling pesticide as agricultural defenders. So the word defenders that the defenders themselves doesn't like, we're challenging that to see other forms that this can, uh, who can move forward to new, new, new concepts to understand environmental struggles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, as Heiko said, so the presentation today is actually the um, uh, preliminary results from our case studies in Vietnam on the politics of refusal for our national scheme on payment for environmental services. We actually collect the data since October last year and in March this year. So we are still in the process of analyzing the data. But um, it's kind of nice to share our, um, some of our preliminary um, military results on the case of Vietnam. So basically in 2008, uh, Vietnam created our uh, National Payment for Environmental Services Scheme. And since 2008, um, it has been well known as one of the first uh, national PFAS scheme in Asia. And I mean, all of the neighboring countries like in Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar, and also Indonesians uh, wanted to apply and replicate the models in Vietnam. 
And um, actually, since 2008, the revenue generated from PFAS program has increased significantly. And in 2018, the revenue generated from the National Pest Scheme contributed to about 30 to 35 percent of the total investment for the forestry sector. A recent study conducted by the government agency also showing that the PFAS revenue and also the PFAS income contributes to um, the um, household's income from 7 to 20 percent of the total household's income. And uh, it has been claimed as one of the successful forestry programs uh, and one of the breakthroughs of the forestry sector uh, for the last 30 years. But it's well, actually quite interesting because C4 has been monitoring, um, we're doing a lot of monitoring and evaluation and impact assessment of the PFAS program. And uh, since 2011, we noticed that in one of the biggest provinces in Vietnam, uh, close to the border between Vietnam and Laos, there was a large population of village um, that are refusing to participate in PES. And actually, despite a lot of um, support and also dissemination and also campaign from the government program for the last seven or eight years, all of these communities have very resist to the PEST program. And I was remember that uh, when we was in one of the study sites, uh, we witnessed one of the government officers hand over to the head of the village about five to six thousand US dollars for three months of the, their um, protection activities. And right in the middle of the night, at the 22nd, um, after they received the money, they're riding back in the middle of the night in their motorbike, about like 100 kilometers away from their village, to return the money for the government. And then um, the, when you're looking at the report, um, the, uh, it's kind of interestingly to see that at first you saw only the resistance in one of the province, but um, our, our data for the last few years showing that the phenomenon has been widespread to the neighboring provinces. And it seems that there is the numbers of villages increasing, uh, the, the numbers of the village who refuse to participate in the national program increase over time. So it's, just have a look at the, uh, the location of the study. And usually in our study and in this type of presentation, we will keep the name of the villages anonymous. But actually, when we're doing the study, it is actually the villagers' interest to ask us to not anonymize their name. They wanted their name to be written and be shared and presented in different for forum. And therefore, for this particular presentation, we will not keep them anonymous as they wish, but put their name sky on the front. So with the research question, we try to understand what are the factors that leads to local resistance to the PEST program, because it is all of the villages that we are working on, the poverty rate is very high. You got a poverty rate about 60 to 80% of the local communities are classified as the poor. And if the narrative of the government are putting forward that the contribution of the PFAS income can contribute to at least 25% of the total household's income, then why they refuse to participate in PFAS? Also, we wanted to know a little bit on the strategies, um, on how the government agency and also local people have adapted to resolve or at least to um, address the problems that they're putting forward. And as I said, we've seen October last year, um, until March this year, we carry out a, lot, a large number of focus group discussion, in-depth interviews, and also key informant interviews in the six villages that we are uh, stuck. With the analytical framework, I guess as we taking a multiple lens from different perspectives, from cultural, historical, uh, political approach to viewing um, the dynamics and what is happening in the six provinces. We also to ch chose to focus on refusal and not resistance because of the, if the resistance involving defying opposing superior, in this particular context, refusal rejects the existing relationship and reposing um, a new relationship and also power. And we wanted to adopt this land in looking at our cases. We also looking from the multiple um, approaches in interpreting and exploring refusal and in our particular context with the Hermon group and with a long traditional complex relationship between the state and the Hermon group in Vietnam and also in Southeast Asia. Um, in a way that many scholars have written about the refusal and the resistance to the government program as a way to break uh, existing relationship and sometimes they empower um, the global communities to widen the political space in their own. So when we're looking at the set of villages who refuse to participate in PFAS, 
Um, it's actually a very complex situation because you have a certain village. Actually, they refused for a few years, and then last year, they suddenly decided that they no longer wanted to receive PFAS. We also have a, um, a certain villages. They always uh, kind of refused uh, to receive PFAS and participate in PFAS for a few years. But since last year, they decided that now I want to be a part of this process. Then you also have a certain numbers of the village that they always refuse. And despite the fact that um, the government program had a lot of support program and association and even incentive for them to accept PFAS program, they still refuse and then there is no room for negotiation. Then you also come to a very few village where there is a different type of uh, payment for environmental contract, whether or not you can sign as individual household you can also sign at a community's member, and then you can also sign in at a group of household. But they chose to participate in a certain form of contract and refuse and resist to participate in another form of contract. So if you're looking at these six villages, it's a very complex system, and it's also a very complex context that driving the decision of different groups in the communities and also different uh, reaction, even though in the six village they are her own group, their reaction and their also their choice are completely different depending on their political and also um, their context per se. So we try to understanding the narrative and the discourse and try to understanding why the local people refuse to participate in PES. And um, we actually found out that different narratives are put up by different stakeholders. Because when you um, discussing about the reason with the government agency, the common narrative putting forward is like the two narrative. First of all is that, oh, you know, like traditionally this Hmong village, they, they have their own religion. But with the um, foreigner influence through the missionary, a large number of people convert their religion into Christian, and then they always against the government. And the fact that they resist to uh, receive the PFAS program is one of the strategy to refuse the current government regime. And that is the narrative, common narrative that you are talking um, with the government officer. The other common narrative, which is also surprise to me, is that uh, a large majority of the government officers who are dealing with this resistance and the refusal to participate in PES is that a bias on uh, you know this certain group of uh, ethnicity. They are incapable. They are very backward, and they don't. They are not well educated, and therefore it's very difficult to work with them in this program. But then you're also coming from the perspective of the local people and local communities. And basically, the, the majors um, of the villager that we interview, they refuse to participate in any form of government program, including the past, because they have a very bad experience with elite capture and the fellow of the previous program that cannot generate any benefit and um, provide any accountability, legitimacy, and transparencies in the past. They also make a point and many quoting saying that the government program, they only benefit government officers and elite group because they are the one who can um, manage the land, doing manage the land grabbing, and then achieves all of the benefit from the government. Also, there is a large number of community members saying that signing PFAS would mean that um, they would need to pay more and pay for corrupted government officers to access to forests. And that's what the main reason why they refuse. But also from the land tenure perspective, um, most of the time that uh, in these six uh, villages, um, the forest land allocation were carried out without any grouse toothing. And then one day the villagers wake up and then their lands belong to the state forest enterprise and the military without even consultation and doing any proper grouse toothing and checking in the area. Looking at the land available now in the six villages, they are belong to the rich group and elite catchers, and there was a strong correlation between elite group and the head of the village to actually own the land, and therefore you can capture the large numbers of a PFAS contract, and they are the one who benefits the most. And um, also interestingly, that all of the government officers that we interview acknowledge that the existing land um, land use rights certificate and the land tenure system was not correct because it has, been, it has not been done correctly, and then they are actually using the wrong data to actually make, uh, to, uh, to make the PFAS payment. But for the last 10 years, there, there has not been any changes, and they're still keeping paying the PFAS payment. 
based on the wrong data and statistic. There is a little bit of uh, reason when we're doing uh, the household survey with about more than 200 households. And basically, the two frequently cited reasons for the six communities is because they are not involved in a BFES program. They do not have any information, or they cannot access to any information because only the elite group can access to the information and therefore can cite BFES. The other thing is signing PFAS will mean that they exposed to the new risk. They will losing the existing land use rights certificate. They will losing the opportunity to using the existing land because the land now is belong to um, other stakeholder. And also the risk is that uh, because they are cultivating in their own land, but the land belong to the other people. So if they signing the contract and protect the land, uh, um, I mean doing some um, activity like Sweden agriculture, they might be put in jail. This figure just again showing with the yellow color that despite the fact that the government for 10 years disseminate and also carry out many propaganda um, activity, that's how they claim. The numbers of villagers that we interview who claiming that they do not know or was not involved in the PFAS program and do not have access to information of the progress, um, the PFAS program, showing that not just only, only the elite capture um, benefit the process, but the, the access to information is also um, become the rise and benefit for only elite group. We also kind of interesting to look at what are the people strategies in responding to this um, situation. And it was quite amazed because the refusal of the Hmong group and the ethnic group people in Vietnam is not actually new. When we're looking at the literature, since 1990, um, the people already refused or resist to participate in government program previously before PFAS on agriculture on forest land and reforestation program. But they all silent and they was kind of, yes, they didn't receive the government officer and signing the program, but they just simply didn't do it. But I think that for the very first time in this community, we see that people refuse to work with the government officer. So when the government officer come out of the village and left, when the government officer sent an invitation letter to the villagers to come to a meeting, the next minute they send someone to return the invitation letter. We also seeing that um, they refuse to use any public facility provided by the government and PFAS program. So for example, the PFAS program, when they're paying for the community, they're building the night health clinic and the school, and the whole community refused to go to the school and refused to use any uh, public health facility provided by the state and also by the PFAS program and as a way to express their opposition to the, the program. They also managed to also send a large number of complaint letter to parliament and prime minister office. And um, over the years that when we interview with the national program, they even managed to um, somehow carry out the informal meeting with the prime minister office and discuss about those issues. Oh, they also uh, using a lot of modern technologies and then whenever they discuss about the topic and negotiate with the government and also express about um, their interest of not participate in the past program and challenge the government officers on how the previous corruption and untransparent activity, they actually live streaming right away to the outside world um, on that issue. And um, um, I mean, some of the village, they took a little bit of more um, I wouldn't say it's negative, but it's actually there was a lot of protesting on the street and then they also kidnapped the government officer and um, refused to participate in signing this one. I think that one of the narrative putting forward is that PFAS with all of this money will incentivize local people and then because they didn't receive PFAS, they will not protect the forest. But actually with our case study, we question a little bit of that additionality of PFAS because with our survey, it's showing that without PFAS uh, present, the, the local communities in six villages, they still protect the forest and very actively engage in their own self-formed group in protecting the forest. So I think that like, this is the plenary result and we still need to work on the data. But actually the historical conflict and the political economies of ethnic cities and the whole experience with the previous experience play a significant role in how the, uh, the local community choose to decide to participate or review the uh, particular process. In this one within a community, we also see that multiple ethnic group co-inhabited in the area, but the source of conflict also defining why some communities member refuse 
and uh, the other community members accept to participate in PFAS. With unclear beneficiary mechanism and rights and responsibility, this is actually the main underlying um, reason why the people keep on refusing it for the last 10 years. But in a way that for what we have done is the resistance and conflict is not always seen as negative. And it's a view by not just only us, but also the government agency and the local communities. Because it opened a way for both the government agency and also the local people to sit down and talk about this. And also to have um, the local community to initiate a new form of dialogue and set up a new political space for them to reposition their powers and with a new access to forest land and also the benefit from the government program. I think we have a lot of data, but the gender relation and how the social network play in this uh, resistance, uh, we have not yet explored, but that would be coming up for our next uh, paper and presentation. Yes, so sorry about that. <laughs> we are, hurry up. John? Okay, this is just a test. Hi, I'm John Foran. I'm in Santa Barbara, California, speaking to you in East Anglia today um, at this wonderful conference of yours. I want to thank the organizers for uh, accommodating a presentation, a remote presentation in this way. And I want to recommend it as a model to academics uh, who are invited to give talks um, in view of the climate crisis itself, which is our subject matter. And it's simply that um, it doesn't seem justifiable anymore, knowing what we now know, to actually fly somewhere to give a 15-minute talk. Um, and so I really appreciate it when conferences accommodate this request. And not everybody's doing that yet. And uh, so congratulations for being ahead of the curve on that. I also want to put in everybody's ear the idea that it's possible to hold an entire conference this way, and my colleague Ken Hiltner and I have been doing this for five years now at UC Santa Barbara where we teach. Um, you can go look for uh, conferences that we've done in the past, all to do with climate issues, uh, at the website of the UCSB Environmental Humanities Initiative. Uh, and there's quite a lot to be said for the advantages of uh, doing this work in this way, working in this way. Um, in fact, for the Q&A, which will follow this, it may be possible for me to be with you over Zoom or Skype. But I'd also like to suggest that you go look for this talk on YouTube and engage in a Q&A there uh, in the comment section and we'll see uh, what's possible, what comes up, and indeed, I think we'll model how it's a great alternative to a conventional Q&A in a uh, session like this one. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I'm a scholar activist. I'm a professor of sociology and environmental studies at UC Santa Barbara, and for 10 years my work has centered around questions of um, climate, the climate crisis, how we are confronting it, particularly as academics and as activists interested in climate justice. And um, of course we have the wind uh, behind our sails in the past year or so with the rise of, of sunrise of Extinction Rebellion in the UK and elsewhere, Sunrise in the United States, and increasingly sophisticated discussion and um, process around questions of uh, the importance of an inner transition and an inner kind of resilience in this work, uh, the importance of acknowledging the emotions that we may feel about the um, scheduled end of the world, let's put it that way. Um, and this is informing our activism and our scholarship in new and exciting ways. And I locate or situate myself within some of this work. I'm very interested in contributing to it. 
and being part of networks and creating new networks and new connections among scholars and activists uh, who want to do this work. So uh, this is a moment. We are really in a moment that I think we can feel good about for a change and um, try and build into something lasting and powerful. Well, um, my talk, I don't have the title in front of me. Um, let me begin by uh, acknowledging or signaling that we're not just in a simple climate crisis. We are in a set of interlocking crises, a kind of triple crisis, uh, both uh, including uh, the global economic crisis that is caused by neoliberal capitalist globalization, uh, signaled uh, most um, horrifically by the obscene amounts of inequality uh, within and between nations that globalization, as we know, has generated. Attending that, a political crisis signaled by a lack of confidence of, of publics uh, wherever there are uh, existing formal democracies, um, lack of um, support for the existing parties, a feeling that no party uh, in any part of the political spectrum uh, is up to the task that we face. Um, and that's of course led to uh, the rise of right-wing uh, authoritarian neo-fascist, um, neo might not be too strong a word to put on it, uh, in places like uh, Brazil and the United States in particular. Uh, and thirdly, I think we're in a kind of culture of violence crisis that refers to the sort of embeddedness of violence in every aspect of our lives from our most intimate uh, interpersonal relationships to the um, militarism uh, of nations led by the United States around the world. And that's the triple crisis, economic, political, cultural. And now we have, of course, the wild card of the climate crisis exacerbating each of these um, deepening the connections and the acceleration of these crises um, and that's the situation that we're in that's the situation that uh, we will be facing going forward and that we have to respond to so I'm a scholar of movements for radical social change um, these would include 20th century social revolutions which I've spent uh, a good part of my career studying the causes of, and now the 21st century movements for radical social change, um, such as the global justice movement, Occupy, the Arab Spring, uh, and the global climate justice movement. These movements differ from those of the 20th century in some interesting and hopeful ways. Um, they are nonviolent on, on the whole. They are non-hierarchically organized uh, in many cases um, and they are looking at sort of trying to overthrow or to change transform uh, whole systems um, through innovative cultural strategic uh, and visionary means one of the concepts that's been very useful in my own work on all of this from the 20th century social revolutions in places from Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, Iran, uh, China, and the 21st century uh, revolutions, which I just referenced, is something I call political cultures of opposition. And I don't think any of these great movements and attempted social transformations have uh, been able to gain any traction without a vibrant uh, political culture of opposition that is um, a widespread sense among many in the population that um, they can articulate the nature of the, the crisis, the problems that they face, whether that's in terms of formal 
ideologies such as socialism, nationalism, uh, democracy, or uh, more popular idioms, everyday language uh, around things like justice, dignity, um, uh, catastrophe now. Um, and I think that it's the elaboration of an effective and vibrant political culture or cultures of opposition that has enabled the coalitions to form that have made all of these big movements. Equally important uh, to a culture of opposition, uh, which is a way of understanding the problem uh, and bringing people together around it, is a what we might call a political culture of creation. And that, of course, refers to the sort of proactive, forward-looking visions that inspire us, inspire activists and social movements, um, their sense of a, an attractive future that would be better than the circumstances in which they exist or we now exist. Um, and I think this is very, very important on all kinds of levels. It's an important part of what motivates people uh, to come together despite all the odds and the uh, pushback, the repression, the inevitable um, difficulties and disappointments of this work. Um, and of course, it provides a, not a blueprint or a roadmap, but a set of um, a set of goals really toward which to strive. And that can uh, help us get from here to there. Um, the idea that I've come to uh, be most interested in, and the one that I talk about the most now, is the notion that these social movements by themselves uh, are not going to overthrow the systems that they are facing, um, nor will political parties, which I've already referred to, um, even though we have some uh, dynamic and uh, progressive sort of left and green left um, parties, including some new formations like Podemos in Spain in particular, which I'll return to, uh, nor will be the building of alternatives at the local level, well, such as the Transition Town Movement, um, the Eco-Village Movement, um, the Degrowth Movement, and others from the Global North and the Global South, but that the uh, creation of what we might call a new kind of political party, not just another new party, but a new kind of political party in the sense that it grows uh, directly out of these movements, on the one hand, in civil society, and out of the local experiences, the sort of positive um, cultures of creation that are taking place, bubbling up from below everywhere. And that such a party, should it have and owe its origins to these forces, um, might be able to um, contest for power in democratic settings and might be able to overcome the kind of almost inevitable uh, complications of revolutionary movements to date uh, by remaining democratic, uh, remaining responsive to uh, their social bases, in fact, um, in, in a way that's unprecedented in history, even uh, as we have uh, sort of hints or glimpses of this in uh, parties such as Podemos, which arose in Spain, of course, out of the occupations of 2011 and other uh, local social movements from below. Um, we have also the Pink Tide governments in Latin America, which are certainly uh, on the ebb, uh, waning now uh, in Venezuela, in, in an awful crisis in Venezuela, uh, having been reversed electorally in Ecuador. Um, and still uh, in power in Bolivia, um, but enmeshed in a set of um, critiques and uh, contradictions in the Bolivian uh, 
movement towards socialism, uh, still driven by fossil fuel extractivism, and um, having sort of turned its back on the social movements, including many of the indigenous movements that brought it to power in the first place in 2005 and six. So I think this is an idea worth discussing as a um, as a potential practical um, action that can be taken by members of society and needs to be, would need to be undertaken in many places. Um, and I think it could happen. I think we've got those kinds of movements, the global climate justice movements, plural in their many manifestations, the local bottom-up initiatives. Uh, if they were to try uh, to come together, I think we could see movement locally, uh, regionally, and nationally. And then, of course, ultimately, uh, globally and internationally on uh, confr in confronting the climate crisis and the attendant economic, political, uh, and cultural crises that we face today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Carment at University of Cambridge, and my question is for Toy. I was um, just wanting to know a little more about the communities which you said had resisted or refused the PFES for so many years and then had made a switch into acceptance. And I wanted to know more about you know, the discourses behind that and why you think that was the case. Thank you. Um, question right in the middle. Please let us know who you are as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, has, has the, uh, the, the, this form of resistance spread or kind of uh, sustained that momentum through time? Um, and if so, kind of what opportunities do you think that presents? Thanks, great. And then there was a question um, on, on this side again. Hello, my name is Mario from the University of Manchester, and it's a uh, question also for Toy. Um, I was wondering if the government has implemented any sort of technical solution to the refusal of the payments. Uh, I, I find the, the, the cases of this refusal super, super interesting. Um, and uh, like based on your, on your presentation, I understand that they are like very uh, politically loaded, obviously, but um, I mean, in that, in, uh, beyond the probably the strategies that on the ground uh, probably the bureaucrats can implement, but obviously because of the um, uh, models in which the payments for ecosystem services programs are usually based, the economists most of the times try to find solutions for that. So it would be really interesting to me to know if if the policymakers of the Vietnamese program have uh, suggest something in that regards. Right. Thank you. Okay. Should I go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so since I did my research, which was the summer of 2017, on that December, they managed to achieve a complete sort of banning of the license of Monsanto to distribute genetically modified soybeans in the country. Um, however, they achieved this more on the on a technicality and this is because Monsanto violated the ruling of the Supreme Court of Justice not not to distribute anything until the consultation was carried out and because they were caught eventually actually distributing it the, the Supreme Court of Justice banned it. Um, regarding um, sort of the spread of the movement this was happening in other parts not of this state but in the neighboring state Quintana Roo 
And this sort of spillover was mostly because of the NGOs that they worked with, which were based in Yucatan. So there was a quite interesting dynamic going in between three states, where the supporting um, NGOs were based in Yucatan, and they would sort of aid these two case studies in the other states. Um, and about the momentum, well, I think, though, now there is this project that is going to go through this area that is called the, the Mayan train. Uh, and so now a lot of the people who were part of this resistance against uh, GM soybeans are, have, have now actually sort of moved on to another topic because um, it is also going to impact quite dramatically on, on sort of the environmental resources of the region. Yes, so thank you for the two questions. I think that with the government strategies and response to this thing, I think that at this step, the government has not, um, I mean, you talk about the government and then you talk about multi-governance. Uh, because at the national level, when we interview and when we doing a little bit of consultation workshop with the national government, um, they have not been really taken into account uh, the, re the refusal and the resistance of the program. Because as you can see in one of our slides, the narrative is that it is a very minor uh, concern and it is a very small communities and then because they just have a um, foreigner influence and that's why they to protest and they have not really addressed thing and taken into account the underlying political economy that you had said so at the moment at the national level the government is still treating it as some sort of um, ad hoc problem rather than treating it as a systematic way at the provincial government I think the response is very different because as I mentioned PFAS has been well known as one of the government's successful program, and they even nominated as one of the 10 breakthrough policies for the last 20 years. And the failure of distributing the money to the local people, reflecting that you know, the provincial government has not been doing a very good job. So they're actually quite active in resolving the problem. And one of the strategies that we have seen, and it's also addressing the question of Rachel, it is in the village that we saw that for seven years they refused and they resist the PFAS program, and they cited in last year. It's because in one year, the government actually sent out quite a large number of government officers to come there. And they actually also organized a village management group who actually stay in the village and then one by one go to individual household disseminate about the benefit of the PFAS and really kind of disseminate information about how wonderful the PFAS program is. They also demonstrate for the last uh, two years of the program is that um, they're working, I mean, one of the reasons is the land allocation process and the land use conflict. And for 10 years, nobody really pay attention to the village. And in one of the, our focal discussion, the village was kind of, we felt that we are um, the forgotten communities because for so many years, nobody, um, I mean, acknowledged our existence of the village because basically with the land allocation process, the village is invisible, the, the village should not be there. And with the government respond in, you know, going there, uh, inviting them to the meeting, um, you know, they feel that they are a part of the social network that they have been forgotten for so many years. And therefore, they, for in, in last year, they took a little bit of more positive thing and then they agreed to participate in PFAS. But actually, when they signing the PFAS last year, they made a very clear uh, agreement with the government that we will try for six months. And all of these requirements that we put forward in terms of the land tenure system, in terms of the transparencies in the decision making process and in terms of information, if it didn't happen within six months, then after six months, we kind of no longer be in the PFAS contract again. So there is still uncertainty, but as I said, with the uh, resistance, at least it's bring attention from the government officer to, you know, to these communities. And some of the things that have been have not been resolved in the past, thanks to this resistance, they are now discussing it about the problem, and at least the government um, trying to address them. But at the national level, it's still a very ad hoc problem, I think. Hey, um, any more questions? Um, also to remind you that John is still with us, so um, he's seeing you, you are not seeing him, but please, if there's questions for him, um, yeah. Hannah will type <coughs> them up for you. Yes, one, two, three, four.
Hello, thank you. I have a question for John, um, which is in, in the, vi the vision that he's just kind of explained to us, what does he see the role of scholar activists within that, people at this event, for example? A question for John too. I mean, actually, it's a bit uh, following up on you. I mean, it's regarding what you mentioned about some movement. For example, you gave the example of Podemos in Spain. I'm Spanish myself, even though I, I'm based in um, in Switzerland. I don't live in Spain for eight, nine years, but I still I follow the political situation in Spain quite well on a daily basis. No, and my question. I don't know if you have the you saw the last the results of the elections, the municipal, regional. Well, my point is that though, what is the scope the scope for action when the progressive forces, the yeah, leftists, socialists, whatever, they have a natural tendency for, of, um, for dis uh, disintegrating any type of coalition they might have at some point when the, when the right uh, parties, the, the, the fascists, the, the, you know, the, the bad guys, I mean, just to put it simple, they got a natural tendency to, to get together. I mean, we have it in, you know, as soon as Bolsonaro was, uh, was elected, uh, I mean, you know, he received the, the, the support from Trump, uh, Orban, uh, you know, every, everyone. Or you have a Steve Bannon tour in Europe, getting to, um, putting together Salvini with the, the, trying to put the Le Pen on board, the Farad. I mean, and they will get it. They will, they will make a global movement of the right. I mean, what is the scope for, for resistance? I mean, and bringing together all these uh, struggles. Yeah. Hi, my name is June Po. I also have a, a question for John. Um, uh, in, the, in the presentation, uh, you talk a bit about how the, the different social movements themselves might not be enough to overthrow this trajectory um, towards this interlocking triple crisis. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about, um, similar to uh, previous uh, question, some starting points or actions that can bridge this gap between the, the political parties, the, the grassroots activities, to the new type of political parties that you mentioned um, in order to start altering the trajectory away and, and what are some of the starting points or your thoughts that you, in, in, your, in your thinking? Thank you. And there was a fourth question right here. Hi, my name is um, Mario Lane from Ghent University in Belgium, and I have a question for Mary and her team. Um, first of all, it seems super impressive to have this huge <laughs> team in all these different cases, and it seems very. Uh, big effort um, and my question is actually quite simple in terms of following up on who are the bad guys pure like technically but who is committing these murders and and would you say that there are differences among the cases in terms of where you could see governmental violence like coming from the government or coming from the private sectors or am I supposed to imagine mafia kind of things because it see it would appear to me that would be relevant to also see amongst the cases. Okay, thank you. Me? Yeah. it is actually um hear your questions to me in the chat space. So I'm very brief because others need to speak. I don't think have time, but, uh, the role of scholar activists. Yeah, that's what we have to invent really. And 
we have some models for that, of course, but I think being in the uncharted place that we are now, everything is on the table and I encourage everybody and most people don't need much encouragement who study our issues to seek their own way to do that. You know, I'm very fortunate in the US. I'm a tenured, I, I always said what I wanted, but I can do anything I want now. So one suggestion for people in that position is of course to make their scholarship public facing. And so now I'm involved in all kinds of network um, websites and virtual conferences and pretty much to publish to conversation with others that activists and scholars us in of the left. Um, I mean, I am on the left. There's no question, but the left has to get over itself. Uh, with everybody. Uh, that is not focus on the crisis. And by focusing on the crisis, I really mean trying to deeply understand that we are in uncharted territory, a new situation. The Anthropocene and our attempt to understand the situation we're in while we're in it, and then to act on it, uh, that's a complex part of the crisis, no doubt. So I thank everybody for noting that and uh, hope that we can continue this conversation over on YouTube. I would love that. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Um, so I'll, I'll answer quickly, and I think Felipe definitely has, has things to say as well. Um, one of the things that we are looking at is who is doing the killing. Um, and from the cases that we see, it's everything from police officers, the military, Hitmen that are hired by large landowners is often the case in, in, in Brazil, for example. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to understand not only who the people who are being affected, but, but who, who is doing the threatening, who is doing the criminalization, and start to unpack are there patterns of behavior that, um, that are more common amongst one sector of perpetrators versus another. Um, and I think one of the things that, that Felipe and I were discussing was can we also start to dig into testimonies of the killers um, and, and why and who paid, you know, who, what motivated them to do it? Um, can we get access to those people who actually carried out the crimes to start to understand a bit more? Um, but I'll let, I'll let Felipe answer as well. Uh, First, I started working uh, with the ideas of the people who are killed uh, in, in terms of showing the protagonism of their fight, you know, that they were not just being, wasn't just poor people being killed without much reason, but that they were really thinking about their struggle. There was a, a huge epistemological contribution. So I uh, visibilized the protagonist. That, that was one of the issues, you know, but then, uh, let's say in, in decolonizing academia in one sense. But then thinking about our positionality in academia, I think uh, on uh, activism and research, it's, have, it's really important to show the killers, exactly what you were saying. You know? it's, it's hard and it's, it's a bit, it can be dangerous in sometimes. In the structure of violence in the Amazon, we have the gunman, the killer, or the, um, the private security company, the paramilitaries. But then over it, you have the ranchers. So I'm trying to understand uh, now to uh, to portray some of the killers who are in jail and they don't have some uh, working with uh, the police station or the or, or records in the legal legal system. 
trying to interview some or getting their, their discourse in the press. It's hard, but we're trying to, 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 to describe who are the killers. And many times the killers are, are neighbors of the, of the kill. You know, mobilized into violence. It's very phenomenal as well, you know, mobilized into violence through a colonial system operating. And also trying to understand the epistemological part of the violence, who are thinking and justifying publicly that some people must be killed, the necropolitics. So the intellectual authors of this violent system were also focused on that. And there is one case of one anthropologist who, who act against indigenous people, against the declaration of indigenous land, uh, being paid by ranchers. I'm trying to get the portrait of this uh, intellectual. I think this is important for us to understand better who are the bad guys. You know, let's let's uh, uh, study our fears. We're gonna. That's how we're gonna face fascism. And in a few years, it's gonna be gone. gone I hope so. <laughs> Okay, I think um, that's all we have in terms of time. Um, a quick break now, but then there's dinner and hopefully you can all make it and we continue our conversations around these topics over dinner and throughout tomorrow and the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, John, and very much everyone here attending in person and all, all of you.